I'm very happy to be uh, to speak about something that I'm very passionate about, and maybe I'll give you a thirty thousand foot view in just ten minutes. And the first question is, I always get asked why rare diseases. So at the outset, it's a very good time to be a mouse. We can cure cancer and we can cure cirrhosis in mice. We can give them the disease and we can cure them. But that's not authentic. That's not real. That's not human biology. The problem with humans is that they're difficult. They have opinions. They don't always take their medicine. Sometimes they smell. Sometimes they miss appointments. It's not so easy to work with humans. But working with humans means you have an opportunity to learn. And if you understand portal hypertension in a rare disease, you can understand portal hypertension in a common disease. And if you learn, you have an opportunity to heal both the rare disease and the more common disease. So when most people ask this question, they say, we're, doing, we're studying rare diseases to help others and people with broader, sort of more common diseases. So you could take nodular regenerative hyperplasia and you can apply some of the knowledge to patients with NASH or hepatitis C. That's partially the reason I'm interested. You could learn about the rare disease itself. Yes, that's a good thing for other people with a rare disease. But a fundamental belief for me, and for me a driving force, is I think everybody deserves the highest level of care. And it's that that motivates me to learn as much as possible about the individual patients and about patients with rare diseases so that we can provide better care to all. There's a problem though. Patients with rare diseases often feel alone. They feel overwhelmed, not understood. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard this repeat after me, you're the first person or the first patient I've seen with, and you can fill in whatever your favorite rare disease is. I hear this over and over and over again from my patients. And it doesn't make them feel, doesn't make me, does, I wouldn't make anyone feel confident. And the time it takes to go to all the doctor's appointments, and no one knows. And the cost, even outside of insurance, travel as an additional cost. So it's not easy dealing with a rare disease from a patient perspective. So there's a big additional problem, which I think deserved an extra slide, its own slide, and that's the uncertainty. So there's uncertainty if, you have, if someone has pneumonia. We know that most people will get better. We know that most people will behave in a certain way. We can predict what's happening and we can talk to the patient and the family and we have a pretty good sense of where things are going. But with rare diseases, there's incredible uncertainty. We really have a hard time telling patients what to expect and that compounds everything. It makes it so much harder. One of an article I read maybe 20 years ago, stuck with me. It was an article in the Washington Post, and it was the introduction to the CIA handbook on torture. And it's not how do we torture other people, but it was what to do if you're captured. And the, and the article spoke about what the aim of torture is. And they said the aim of torture is to make you feel uncertain. It's to make you question your core beliefs such that you really give up on yourself. And if you think about rare diseases, there's only uncertainty and core, talk about a core value yourself in your life, that's about as fundamental as you can get. So this really is a problem when you're dealing with rare diseases, how do you make peace with uncertainty? But I'm gonna argue that you have to make peace with uncertainty. I'm gonna argue that it's really important that we come to sort of a place of acceptance because that uncertainty robs us of so much. And I'm going to allude to this as we go through. To start, there's little to be afraid of. I know that bad things happen to good people. I'm not naive. I see it. It's what I do. But this is not something we have control over. So if we don't control it, let's not get sucked into it. Most things can be dealt with by using first principles. Remember in the first slide, I said, you can learn about portal hypertension in NRH or in congenital hepatic fibrosis 
or in allergial syndrome. And you can, it's the same portal hypertension as you see in NASH or hepatitis C or hepatitis B. So first principles means that it doesn't matter what the disease is, the complications can be dealt with in the same way. And the ostrich that puts its head into the sand is still gonna be eaten by the lion. So it's better to accept, preempt than to catch up later. So no fear because if there are first principles and if there are ways to deal with things, then we need to exploit that and we need to work with that. And that in a way for me is extremely reassuring. So if we've outlined briefly some of the problems, just touched on them, let's talk about some of the solutions. So this is preaching to the choir. I feel like I'm taking coals to coal to Kentucky because you're already here, you're listening, but the message is to get involved, be proactive, and it's not hopeless. There's so many resources. The American Liver Foundation, I don't know if you've heard of the American Liver Foundation, but if you haven't, you should look them up. The ALF is fantastic. They have incredible resources. Academic centers, the NIH, the, intramur the intramural program at the NIH, which I'm a part of, or the extramural program, clinical trials. And I would encourage you to have a love-hate relationship with Dr. Google. And by that, I mean Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all of Twitter, not just Google itself. Embrace because there's so much information out there. There's so many resources. There's so many legitimate resources. And beware because everybody had an aunt with the same condition who was cured after she drank onion juice. And they will only charge you half a million dollars for that onion juice. So beware of people taking advantage of that uncertainty. We did a study years ago with hepatitis C when there weren't good treatments. We found that about 60% of our patients were taking complementary and alternative medicine. We repeated the study recently where cure rates are 99%. We found that none of our patients were taking complementary and alternative medicine. So my fear is that people get taken advantage of when there aren't clear answers. So some more thoughts. This is more than marriage, there's no divorce. So if that's the case, and if we have no choice, we have to establish that this does not define you. And although you can't always move on, although one can't always move on, we can always move forward. Moving on meaning leave it behind, but moving forward means living your life. And my favorite poet, Maya Angelou, has a wonderful line where she says, life loves the liver of it. And I don't think she was thinking about liver as in we're thinking about liver. She meant the person who lives it. But I think that that applies really well here. So what else can you do? You can build a team. You can build a fantastic team, family, friends. There are others, church, I didn't mention, church, religious resources, social groups, patient care groups, patient foundations, so many things that you can plug into, ALF and healthcare professionals. And this is a core component of your team. And like us or hate us, you have no choice but to engage with us. And I think there's some things that have come up over the years that my patients have taught me. First, you want healthcare professionals that's open that will listen to you. Second, it doesn't matter if they don't know about the disease, but they have to be prepared to learn with you and be available and accessible. You have to build trust because you'll need them in times of crisis. And it's easier to do this in centers of excellence. It's even better if they have experience in your particular disease. And there are centers around the country where certain centers have more experience with certain diseases than others. So I would encourage you to seek out a center which has experience in your problem. And here, what we do is we establish a two-tiered system of care. That means that the person has a local liver doctor, if they live in Spider Breath, Nebraska, we find someone there who's accessible, open, caring. And then we provide the tertiary care. So getting care at a hospital or in a medical system far from where you live doesn't mean that you have to be there all the time. It means you have access to additional resources who can guide the care you're getting at home. Let's talk a little bit about genetics because this is a field that's exploding. There are a couple of difficulties with genetics. So diseases can look the same, but be different genes. 
and diseases can look different, but be the same genes. And lastly, diagnosis does not equal treatment or cure. Patients often a year or two after being given a genetic diagnosis are disappointed and frustrated. They feel let down. And when I ask them why, they say, because I thought once I knew what I had, I would be better. But a diagnosis doesn't equal the fact that there may or may not be treatment. So why do we do genetics? Well, first of all, it stops the search. It allows us to name the disease. Second of all, it allows finding others. So you can create groups of people with rare diseases. And once you have groups, you can start to develop therapies or understand the biology. And even if no specific therapies are available, complications are copycats. And people with similar diseases have similar complications. And there are lots of therapies for complications of liver disease. So the bottom line, get engaged. And remember, I said it's more than marriage. So if it's a commitment that you have no choice with, you may as well jump into the engagement, get yourself a big ring, have no fear. And remember, make peace with the uncertainty because it's something we don't have control of. Live, you have to live your life. You have to dream. You have to do whatever it is that you want to do. Doesn't mean you can run away from it. The Nile is a river in Egypt. We're not living there. You have to live where you are. You have to find care. You have to continue your own education and the education of your healthcare providers. Did I mention that you have to live? If you want to get married, if you want to go to college, if that's possible, if that's within your realm, you have to live. Build the team you need and want around you, family, friends, healthcare providers, and others. And look for the cutting edge. Look for where people are doing innovative, creative things. People are exploring. There are so many places where so much is happening. Knowledge is exploding. Don't stay out of it. Stay inside. And that's where Dr. Google can be helpful. And lastly, live your life. Don't stop for one second. Don't let this steal a nanosecond from your life. This is a picture taken last week. I was on vacation at Chincoteague. And it's the dawn. And I think that we're, we are at a new dawn for, genetic, for rare liver diseases. There's increasing interest. When I started thinking about rare diseases 25 years ago, 20 years ago, it was hard to get people engaged. And there was a sense of futility. Meetings like this today show that there's no futility, shows that there's a serious interest in developing knowledge and therapies. So I'm very grateful to be part of this and I wanna thank you for your attention.